Hello there and welcome to a portrait painting demonstration. We're going to start off today with the underpainting of a Rembrandt self-portrait. And today we're going to be working on a, a sheet of oil primed linen canvas. So what I'm doing is I'm just toning it with diluted burnt umber oil paint. I'm using Winsor & Newton burnt umber colored oil paint and I diluted it with a little bit of odorless mineral spirits and I just spread the tone with a paper towel. And I'm going to type up the materials that I'm using in the description box below for those of you that are interested in what I'm using. Here is an image of the Rembrandt self-portrait and I'm going to keep a picture of it to the top left corner of your screen very much in the style of my older portrait painting tutorials. If you've seen my older videos, I just thought I'd bring it back. So for today, we're going to be creating the monochromatic underpainting using just burnt umber oil paint. And we're drawing with a, a pretty, pretty small brush. This is a size two master's touch around synthetic brush. So what I'm going to do is put in a rough estimation of where I think I want the portrait to fit. Again, this is a very uh, difficult task that we are uh, taking on. So the first thing we want to do is just let go of all the fear, all the fear involved in trying to get the linear drawing just right or trying to get anything just completely right. Um, this is going to be a building process. So for the Rembrandt, I'm pretty much going to use the classical approach to creating portrait paintings. Uh, that is, I'm going to start off with just a monochromatic underpainting. So right now, I'm just getting an idea of where I want the portrait to fit. So I think I'm going to make it a little bit larger. So one advantage to that um, first initial wash of the uh, thinned out burnt umber oil paint is that it allows me to erase very very easily so the paint is handling just like charcoal now for those of you that don't like the uh, way that charcoal handles you don't have to work in this way uh, you can work with a uh, kind of like a a more indirect approach where you create a transfer drawing and then transfer it onto the paper that's certainly uh, another way to approach this perhaps an even safer way to approach this but I feel like for today for the start of this Rembrandt painting I think that drawing it out with uh, oil paint it just is going to have a little bit more of an organic feeling so now I'm looking at the corner the left corner of the canvas I threw in a pretty uh, simple diagonal line so I think that's where I want to crop the side of the hat and now I'm putting in another place marker for the top of the forehead. So the top of the forehead is going to fit somewhere about there. Now you don't have to know exactly where you're going to place each individual shape of the composition right away. But what you should do is just put in some estimations. Notice how I'm putting in a mark maybe at the top a mark maybe at the bottom and then erasing it just trying to get a feel for where everything is going to fit and I think this is a really good way to warm up uh, it's kind of like in a, if you're playing a sport you're warming yourself up for uh, the many backflips you're gonna do or the somersaults or uh, whatever kind of stunts you're going to do we're going to treat painting as an activity, as a productive activity that takes a little bit of thinking, quite a bit of thinking, and it, it takes a certain mindset. And right now we're just getting into the mindset of uh, how we're going to take on such a, such a monumental task. So we're going to look at the corner of the side of the hair. Maybe the, the side of the hair fits there, maybe it doesn't. And again, this is all very much going to be a building process. This Rembrandt painting is going to take maybe two or three videos to complete. At the current moment, I think it's probably going to take three. So this is going to be um, kind of the 
the drawing, the simple drawing stage, um, but you're going to see how the drawing is going to develop in a very loose, a very organic kind of way. It doesn't always have to be that way, but you know, we got to change things up once in a while. And again, I am uploading these YouTube videos every single day, so I thought it's it's a good idea to throw in a couple different uh, paintings here and there. So we're going to be looking at this Rembrandt uh, painting for at least a couple videos. So let's take a look now at the simple shapes that we've established. So right now, I think we've finally figured out where we want the simple shape of the head to fit within the parameters of our canvas. And now that we have an idea of where we want the head to fit, it's all a matter of subdividing larger shapes into smaller shapes and trying to slow down our observation. We're trying to slow the pace a little bit. So in the beginning, it was really fast. We were throwing some lines here and there. And now we're going to take it a little bit more slowly, a little bit more relaxing. So now that the pace is starting to, to slow down a little bit, it's also going to pick up. So that means that we're going to be um, putting in much more specificity now into the outside shape. Less is more is certainly going to be a uh, kind of like a virtue in this stage of the painting. So I'll tell you what, if you're ever kind of nervous to start a portrait, if you're ever kind of nervous maybe you haven't painted that many portraits before and um, the subject or the sitter is um, staring you right in the eyes like the Rembrandt self-portrait is, go for the outside shape. You can't do yourself any harm by going for the outside perimeter of the shapes and just thinking two-dimensionally or just thinking how these shapes look like in the peripheral vision. So if we're looking at the side, imagine you're just looking at the side of the model's uh, face, imagining that you're just, just at a glance, okay? Just imagine you're looking at the model at a glance. Take in all of the information you can take in at a glance. Guarantee you, you cannot see any detail. I guarantee you that you cannot see nostrils, eyelids, eyelashes, none of that stuff. What you see is shape, and trying to trying to see in sequence. You're kind of learning how to see. Um, so, uh, for instance, right now we're starting to put in an indication for where the ear is going to to fit. So, right now the the face, the simple shape of the face, may be a little bit too narrow, uh, but we will certainly adjust that as the painting develops, maybe in this video, maybe in the next one, but we're considering it as a building process. And again, I'm using a size 12 Filbert bristle brush, a clean bristle brush as my eraser. And the bristle brush is a little bit more firm. Uh, it pushes the paint a little bit more than uh, this brush that we're using here. That brush that we're using uh, right here is a synthetic brush. You don't have to use any type of drawing brush in particular. Over the years I've gone from using size 4 filberts to draw to size 2 uh, filberts and round filberts to draw, uh, but I'm kind of sticking with this, I, this size 2 round synthetic brush. And again, the brand is Master's Touch for the drawing brush. I've just typed it up in my description box so many times, I, I uh, kind of just remember what it is now. Um, another thing that we need to note is that the canvas, you're viewing the canvas from a corner. So the camera is at a slight corner. That's just so that I don't block the footage um, and so that I can paint with a little bit less uh, less influence of the camera being right in front of my face. So again, uh, 
the image is going to look a little bit different since you're viewing it from the side, but I'm going to show you what the painting looks like front and center near the end of the video. I think the last clip of this video. So in any case, we actually did just push the ear a little bit further to the left. Uh, I did note that the ear was a little bit uh, scrunched. It was kind of making the face a little bit too narrow. So we pushed it a little bit with the uh, the filbert, or sorry, with the flat bristle brush, this brush that we're using right here. And again, we're taking our sweet time with this stage. I'm trying to show you as much of the real-time footage and guide you through this footage as much as possible. Now we're going to take a stab at the, uh, the features of the face. The first thing we're going to look at is the center line. So we just made a little gesture for where the center line is going to fit and now we're drawing the little shapes for the eye sockets. So there's the concavity of one eye socket there to the left and maybe just a single brush stroke here and there for where the eyes are going to fit. Now, it doesn't have to be written in stone. Uh, each mark doesn't have to feel like, like you're drawing with a Sharpie or with something that just will never erase. Oil paint just has the nature um, that it is very easy to work with. It allows you to erase it and to move it and to be a little bit indecisive, which is a very nice attribute for, at least for me, so now we're starting to block we're starting to block in a simple shape for the uh, concavity of the eye socket to the left and to the right of your screen. Now here's where it's going to be uh, a little bit a little bit tricky. So we're going to be looking at simple shape, simple patterns of light and dark, knowing that we're not going to get them completely uh, correct in the beginning. So here's where um, a little bit of bravery, a little bit of brave brushing is going to have to come into come into play here. Be faithful to your eye. Draw what you see, paint what you see. Make sure to stand back and to know that things are going to be wrong at first. That's natural. It's going to happen. It's always going to happen. I'm sure it happened to Rembrandt. I'm sure it happened to Sargent, Caravaggio, all of them. We're all human. Start off with something. And that something that we're starting off with is very simple shape. Keeping our shapes simple and easy to work with. Those of you that have been watching these videos long enough will be able to finish this sentence. Keep your shapes simple and easy for you to understand. All right, come on, finish my sentence. Keep your shape simple and easy for you to understand. So when the time comes to make the changes, those changes are simple and easy to manage. Those of you that were able to finish my sentence, pat on the back, pat on the back. I would shake your hand right now if I could. But in any case, for those of you that are newer to this channel, the main message is know what you're after know what you're looking for and know how to look for it right now we're looking for simple shape simple patterns of light and dark knowing that we're going to get it wrong at first you got to start with something start with something and you will continue to build you will continue to develop what it is you're after and so what we're looking for is proportion and shape. Remember proportion just means a relation of one thing to another thing. So we have to have all the things out on the table to relate to one another. That's just how we work with proportion. It doesn't always have to be that way. You know me. You know I've made uh, other kinds of videos using different tactics. Sometimes just starting off with an eye and then moving from there. There are so many different ways to approach it, so make sure not to subscribe to only one way of working all the time. Always have a little bit of variety. You'll, you'll notice it even in, 
even in my painting videos. There's so much variety in how I uh, provide these videos to you. This tactic, uh, this video tactic is uh, my older style. This was how I used to make my videos. And it's a little more laid back, a little more relaxing, pretty much more focused on the actual painting, I will admit. Um, but just keep variety in life. Variety is really, really important to painting. So now we just throw in a little shape for the eye to the left of your screen. Now those eyes, Rembrandt paintings really do uh, speak to us in terms of, I don't know, a compelling personality. You can really see the personality that each of his sitters has. And especially in his self-portraits, you can see almost, it's almost like he's looking into your soul. That's the type of, uh, the type of human psychology that you get out of a Rembrandt um, painting. In particular, I think the fact that the irises on the painting, on the Rembrandt painting, the irises are pretty dark. They're pretty dark. They're contrasting now. I don't know if that's because of the, the photo reference that we're using, but I think that the darkness of the, uh, the iris, the darkness of the iris, kind of gives more of, I don't know, a psychological connection with the viewer. So that's why I threw in so, so that's why I'm throwing in these darker shapes for the irises now. In general, I will say kind of hold back from uh, the iris for quite a long time. Here we are, I think, 17 minutes into this video. And just now starting to throw in the iris. I usually would recommend hold back on the iris for a pretty long time. I'd say hold back on the iris for maybe like a good hour. Try to imagine the shape of the eye socket uh, for a good hour before throwing in any smaller shapes. But there's this type of psychological connection you get from a Rembrandt that, I don't know, to me it just makes me want to throw in the iris a little bit more quickly and try to work with these shapes. So in any case, now we're starting to look at the little shape here for the uh, globella. The globella is the, the the intersection between the two eye sockets. So now we're kind of moving back and forth between the side plane of the face and the globella. Those are two uh, shapes that I kind of, uh, th those are two structures that I kind of relate uh, to one another. And so just kind of moving all around the picture really, just trying to continue to build, trying to establish uh, the, the likeness of the model with just a simple shape. Now we're going to take a look at the, uh, pretty much all around the portrait. So I'm drawing the side of the ear. Now the side of the ear may be too big. Um, so we'll go ahead and just cut into that a little bit. And now we're going to start to put in the uh, a little dark shape for the the hat, a dark shape for the side of the hat. And you know what? Let's just simplify this shape here for the eye socket. So I did just obliterate some of the uh, brush marks there that were in the uh, the iris. Still want to keep the dark of the iris, but uh, kind of simplifying it a little further. So we just obliterated a little shape there for the nose. So we're using a kind of a wipeout tactic. So we subtracted a little bit with the uh, with the bristle brush and now we're going back in and carving out the contour uh, with the with the drawing brush. So kind of back and forthish. So now we're starting to go very much back and forthish between the eraser brush and the drawing brush. Another thing I should note is that um, the fact that I'm using the oil primed linen makes this tactic, this technique, a little bit easier. If I was using a cotton canvas and trying to use this technique 
uh, acrylic cotton canvas, it'd be a little bit more slick. So it'd be s slipping around a little bit more than I would want. So again, if you want to use this type of technique, I would recommend at least using acrylic primed linen, oil primed linen, if you can, if you can find it. It's kind of hard to find in the art stores. Now we're going to start to kind of approximate uh, the structures for the mouse, where the mouse may or may not be. The important thing is to just throw something in there. Um, be deliberate with it, knowing that it could be wrong. So in this case, that's probably going to be done with a little bit of a smear. So I put in a brush stroke with the drawing brush and then kind of just smudged it to create a little bit of a kind of a, a smear for where the mouth may fit. And now we're going to take a look at the uh, the darker shapes. So now I'm going to be using a uh, a size 11 Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. I think it's an 11, 11 or 12. But in any case, it's a Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle, fairly large brush. This is my favorite brush. So I'm going to use it now to just cover these darker shapes. A little bit of a dark shape here for the hat and for the side. Now the beauty of burnt umber is that burnt umber doesn't get as dark as uh, ivory black. So using something like raw umber or burnt umber in your underpainting actually can compress the value range, which is pretty nice. It's actually a very nice feature to have when you're creating an underpainting. So now with the paint diluted a little bit, uh, we're going to kind of just spread a light pass of paint into the background just using kind of the uh, the thinness of the paint so we thinned it out with the odorless mineral spirits just the thinness of the paint to help cover these darker shapes so we're just going to spread the uh, tone all the way down here and this is just to kind of help us see the light and dark shapes with a little more clarity. Throw in a little dark shape here on the back of the, the face. Let's go ahead and throw in that dark shadow right underneath. And we're not terribly concerned about the value arrangement just yet. It's really all about that simple pattern of light and dark and making sure that it's in the relative correct position. We are now uh, 23 minutes into the painting with 40 something minutes left in this sitting. So the important thing is to make sure that these large shapes are well established. And this is really the major advantage in working in layers as opposed to working a la prima. So the last time I attempted a Rembrandt master copy, uh, I, I kind of had this idea of trying to do it a la prima style. And I just, I will never do that again. Um, the difference between working in layers and working in a la prima is that a la prima just kind of implies painting wet on wet usually not always but usually just with one sitting when trying to paint a Rembrandt trying to do it in one sitting probably isn't the best uh, way to approach it I, I just took it kind of as a challenge for myself and it definitely was a challenge so now we're putting in titanium white this is the same brand, Windsor and Newton, titanium white. So we're going to use just the titanium white itself to throw in a, uh, a highlight on the forehead. And we're going to use the transparency of the paint to help to spread the tone around, meaning the more pressure I put on the brush stroke with the titanium white, the brighter, the less pressure, the darker. doesn't always have to be that way. Um, for instance, with my underpainting, so you usually see me mix up a value scale. But 
for this instance, I don't really care that much about getting each value completely right. Instead, I'm kind of trying to use the titanium white to kind of put in a value for the lights. It doesn't mean that I won't focus on value. It just means that I'm using the lights to help me uh, further differentiate the, uh, the large shapes of light and dark. So now notice how with less pressure in the uh, the middle of the frontal region of the skull, so with less pressure uh, we have a darker shape almost automatically. So we're going to do the same thing on the side of the forehead, just spreading uh, a nice and even tone. So with the underpainting, I, I usually say it's a little bit uh, safer to go lighter with the underpainting just so that you can build up uh, darker and warmer shapes uh, using transparencies as you continue to develop the number of layers that you add. So now we're putting in a little bit of light um, on the top side of the eye socket to the left of your screen and throw in a little bit of a soft edge here near the, the eyebrows a little bit more light here for the top plane for the uh, corner of the eye socket a little bit more light right there so one thing to note about uh, the way that I'm applying the paint is that I'm also thinking now about form, but not form in the sense that I'm trying to completely render anything. It's just that I'm putting in little accents of form uh, to kind of help guide the shapes that I'm placing down. So just having a little bit of uh, indications of form having a little bit of a three-dimensional look to something kind of adds another uh, kind of another filter that your eye has to to judge or evaluate from so we're throwing in a little bit of light right there so the first brush stroke of light is on the side of the uh, the tear duct and that's a plane that's receiving quite a bit of light and the same thing is going to happen here with the upper eyelid. So these little accents of light, accents of form, are being placed uh, just so that I can see my shapes of light and dark with much more clarity than um, if it were just two tones. And it's a little different as well. I don't know, I just I like to do things differently. It's just my style, really, to do things differently. Another thing I should note, I'm sure, is here we are, 28 minutes already, and um, most of you that watch my videos already know that I'm doing this uh, narration and voiceover style. So another thing that I should note that I've been noticing with the way that I work is that I'm much faster and much more accurate um, when I'm painting without talking. Not always the case, um, but the reason I chose to film this one in this way is because I can be much more precise and much faster um, when I'm painting and not really worrying about talking. So that's why I'm doing the narration afterwards. But I do actually enjoy painting and talking at the same time. It's quite a bit of fun for me. And you know that most of my videos um, have been done in that style. So this is really the first kind of voiced over and completely voiced over uh, painting video that you've seen in a very, very long time. So, yeah, another thing to note is that I am much faster when I'm painting without having to talk while I'm painting. But in any case, trying to get back to the painting here, it, it also makes it a little more difficult, though, to stay on topic. So, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So, let's take a look at the zygomatic bone, this little plane right here for the cheekbone. 
Now, with the Rembrandt painting, his understanding of form is incredible. I think Rembrandt is one of the... Uh, here I am getting off topic again. So we're looking at the form and the forms that Rembrandt painted. So we started off with the top plane of the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone. Then we now we moved over to the top plane for the nasal bone. So the nasal bone and the zygomatic bone are two regions of the face that are receiving quite a bit of light because those planes, as most of you know, they're receiving more light because those planes are facing the light a little bit more. And now we're putting in our first little indication of a half tone. So I didn't really mix it on the brush. What I did was I just I took a little bit of the burnt umber that was in the little puddle of paint and just kind of started mixing that value on the painting. So again, different tactics. It's all it's all for the sake of exploration really. So a little bit more light there for the bottom uh, the top plane near the bottom of the nose. So we're kind of spreading a light tone for the bulb of the nose. So you can see how we're kind of drawing with the the light paint as well. This is very similar to charcoal. The um, the white paint is also analogous to drawing with a chamois. The chamois is the cloth that you use to uh, subtract, to erase the charcoal off of the, the paper. So very similar. The only thing is I will say that oil paint does allow you much more control uh, than charcoal. So anyway, looking at the bottom of the bulb of the nose, I'm kind of trying to notice the shape or the characteristic of his nose. His nose is actually kind of similar to mine, at least the bulb of his nose. Um, that is, the front of his nose is a little more round, which is kind of similar to how my nose is. I'm just careful not to paint, uh, paint it too round. I think my nose is a little more round than his. Now we're looking at the top plane of the orbicularis oris. Uh, that is the structure that encompasses the shape of the mouth. So right beneath the, the nose, there was a plane that was facing the light quite a bit. Now we're moving on to the side of the face, pretty much just spreading a tone all throughout. And we started out with more pressure near the zygomatic region of the face just to apply a lighter tone. Now we put in a little bit of burnt umber taken right from the puddle of paint above to put in a very strong dark for the side plane. Of course making it darker than need be just to kind of scumble a little bit more paint. Uh, now the word scumble doesn't refer to a pattern of any sort. The word scumble just means literally to spread the paint around. I don't know if that's the right way to use that term um, some people don't like that word, so I'll try to not use it. So what I'm doing is just spreading the paint, starting off with the area that's lighter, and lightly with very light dabs of paint, whispering the paint across the surface. So we're going to take a look now at the mouth, kind of softening, kind of blurring out that shape. Something I usually... <laughs> Something I usually say is, uh, when in doubt, blur it out. So that's certainly what I'm doing with the mouth. The mouth tends to be one of the areas that, uh, at least for me, moves around quite a bit in the painting. And it's, just on a practical note, the mouth is the easiest thing to change or to adjust. So that's why you'll see most painters actually kind of neglect the mouth for quite a while and focus more on the main, more into the main triangle. The main triangle meaning the two eyes and the nose. So now we're starting to put in some more value changes 
as we approach the bottom of the zygomatic region. And now just kind of cross-relating each form to one another. So now we're relating, uh, say, the light from the mouth to the bottom of the uh, orbicularis oris as it tapers down towards the chin. So we're kind of cross-relating each individual shape. And again, another, like a big change in the style of this video in comparison to the uh, the ones I've been uploading um, the past couple of days is again this is done in voiceover so as I was painting here we are 35 minutes into the painting I've actually done quite a bit in 35 minutes this this is remarkably fast for how uh, I usually paint in my uh, my videos so again just to change things up I just want to show you kind of how I paint when I don't have to focus on painting and talking but in any case now we're spreading a little bit of a, a tone near the side of the face I still think that the face is a little bit too uh, too elongated but again it's also going to look a little elongated because the camera is at an angle but we are going to adjust that uh, later on in the development of this painting. I think the proportions are almost there. The proportions being the uh, relations between the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. Now we're starting to throw in some darker shapes for the mouth. Starting off with the side of the, the mouth. And now working to the other side. Just taking a look at these simple patterns of light and dark. The mouth also kind of gives quite a bit of expression, but not just the lips, but the entire structure around the mouth. You can kind of tell if somebody's frowning without actually looking at their lips. If you look ar around the lips, you can still kind of tell. But in any case, now we're kind of we're moving all around the picture really so now we're moving towards the uh, the eyes again so a little brush mark for the uh, top plane of the upper eyelid to the right of your screen and now we're putting in a little bit more paint and we're actually moving that eye a little bit down so I think that initially it was a little bit too uh, too high now we're lowering it a little bit. And now we're just evenly distributing the paint around the, the side of the shadow. Just trying to flatten out that shadow just so it's not too distracting. I try to keep the shadow shapes uh, rather quiet, meaning not a lot of activity within those shapes. And now we're going to strengthen the uh, the light for the, uh, the top plane of the nasal bone. So that's what we just did there. Also kind of sharpening that edge as well. So we're thinking quite a bit about the mask of the face now. So we're putting in quite, quite some information for the... Uh, the major planes of the face. So the major planes of the face uh, are what construct the mask of the face, the larger shape. So now taking a look at the side of the uh, forehead, this is the superciliary arch. So the uh, superciliary is the side kind of like the uh, frontal ridge of the skull. Now we're taking a look at a little bit of light here for the um, the bottom of the shirt that he's wearing and kind of relating all of the lights to one another. It's another thing I didn't really notice. Um, when I'm painting and not talking, I actually move around the picture quite a bit more with a little more frequency than uh, when I'm painting and demonstrating and talking and filming at the same time. So I think that actually makes the process go much faster. I'm starting to notice moving back and forth between the shapes. 
not always the case though. So now we're putting in a little a little shape near the uh, glabella. So that's a pretty predominant shadow near the glabella. And it's also going to give us uh, a little more of uh, Rembrandt's expression. He certainly had a very serious look to him, but almost kind of serious yet relaxed look. So you kind of get the seriousness from the eyes. Uh, you can see how the glabella is com it's fairly compressed, like he's almost squinting at us. But then the mouth is much more relaxed. So that's where we're getting that serious yet kind of relaxed look. And just putting in some more little half tones there for the side of the the forehead and we're going to put another little half tone here again just relating all of the shapes to one another softening this little edge on the corner kind of fun fact here that little light shape on the side of his nose is a kind of kind of an iconic shadow shape it's also referred to as rembrandt lighting and we'll return to the subject of Rembrandt lighting in, in a little bit. So right now, we're still pushing the, uh, the light shapes. So we're kind of keying the light shapes in relation to one another, meaning we're judging one shape of light uh, in relation to another shape of light in terms of their relative brightness. So that means that the light on the, the forehead is probably one of the lightest lights and one step down from that is the uh, possibly the light on the nasal bone and then one step down from that would be the light on the cheekbone the zygomatic bone and then um, just moving along and comparing the light shapes to one another in that fashion so now we're looking at the side of the face so again just kind of trying to uh, further develop the drawing at the same time with the value so that is uh, trying to develop the contours of the side of the face along with the uh, value arrangements as well but again um, it's not really too critical to get all of the values just right the underpainting really is about uh, developing the drawing or at least getting the drawing started now we're pushing a little bit of a light shape this is almost kind of like a little uh, valley of light on the side of the the model's face now we're just going to spread a little bit more light on the side of the zygomatic region of the face and again we're keying that value in relation to the value on the top plane of the nasal bone And now we're going to start to draw a little bit of a, a contour for the model's clothing. So here we have the little collar there for the uh, for the models. I keep saying the model for a collar for Rembrandt's um, the uh, clothing, the costume that he's wearing. Now throwing a little bit of light for the the neck. Probably shouldn't call it costume. If I wore it, it'd be a costume. But uh, for Rembrandt, this was the look. Was it the look of the day? I'm sure. That, I'm sure it was stylish in the day. Hey, if I could find a hat like that, if anyone wants me to wear a hat like that, if you can find it, if you can find that that hat that Rembrandt's wearing, that type of hat, I will totally wear it in um, one of my painting videos. But in any case, we're starting to put in a little bit of a boundary between the uh, the cast shadow on Rembrandt's neck. And again, even at this stage, here we are 44 minutes into the painting, even at this stage, we're still keeping things simple and easy to work with. None of the shapes are super refined, none of the shapes are highly rendered. We're still keeping them simple and easy to work with. And again, this is going to be a layered process. So uh, today we're going to have the 
underpainting. Tomorrow, you're going to have the first color pass. And then, of course, we're going to have to return to the uh, larger painting that we're working on in the studio. Just a little change, change of pace. Now we're throwing in a little bit of a, a half tone, or in this case, it's probably even a dark light for the side of the the model's face, also giving us kind of that expression that he has. Now we're just kind of softening that dark shape that we put in for the side of the zygomatic bone. And we're pushing in some little form overlaps for the model's forehead. A little bit of overlapping of form. A little bit more light right there for the uh, the front of the forehead. And now we're going to re return to the Rembrandt lighting that we were talking about. So this shape right here is the Rembrandt lighting. That's the iconic little triangle of light. And now we're lighting one side of the uh, cheekbone to the other side. Notice how we kind of are moving from one side of the face to the other side of the face. Just kind of pushing that um, that tear duct a little bit, the light for the tear duct. So funny story, so as I was painting, uh, as I started this painting, or I think throughout most of it, I was actually listening to a Rembrandt documentary a really nice Rembrandt documentary. I'm going to leave a link in the description below. Hopefully I rem remember to do that. I'm going to leave a link in the description below to that really uh, nice Rembrandt documentary here on YouTube. So we're still examining the little contour for the ear and now we're just going to throw in a little bit of a shape there for the side of the tragus of the ear. Still trying to keep the shape simple and easy. That ear uh, is very, very well simplified, so any any adjustments that need to be made can be made uh, with great facility. So now we're throwing in a little bit of light for the hair. I think that the hair is probably going to get a little bit too light in the underpainting, to be honest, but that's all right. There's always the next day to continue to work on this. And like I said, I think that this... Uh, Rembrandt Master Copy is probably going to take maybe about three, maybe three videos, maybe even four, four sittings, that is. So a little bit of light there for the, uh, for the hair. So now, another thing that's kind of interesting to talk about, uh, something that I usually can't talk about when I'm painting and talking, uh, is... The fact that the process is simplified such that each uh, each layer kind of builds up to the next, but that's a very linear way of looking at it, whereas painting is not so linear. And what I mean by that is that you usually don't have every stage of the painting work out each time. So you, there's a lot of back and forth-ish things that, that go along with the process. And that's another reason why I say you got to keep your shape simple and easy to work with. Because a lot of back and forth-ish stuff can happen. But in any case, now we're just kind of keying the lights a little bit more. I think we only have about, um, I think, 15 minutes left in this video. So now we're just pushing a little bit more of the light there for the top plane of the forehead. Also kind of sharpening that plane, that division of plane. So we're sharpening that edge while keeping it softer, say, in relation to the edges of the forms around the side of the, uh, the zygomatic bone. Now the the forms on the face are still going to need quite a bit of refinement. So again, I, I'm not really after trying to perfectly obtain 
the forms on the face just yet. I'm just trying to establish these large patterns of light and dark. Just going to soften this little edge there. So I think that that edge on the side of the, uh, the model's nose, the little the frown line, I think that's uh, referred to sometimes, it's a little bit too much of a sharp line. So we'll soften that maybe in this video, maybe in tomorrow's video. So still pushing that dark shape for the, uh, the mouth. We're adding just a little touch of light there for the top plane of the upper lip and also kind of sharpening that edge. And that little metal pole that you see on the side is a mall stick. So it, I'm just leaning my hand on that pole just so my hand, uh, just so my pinky doesn't get into the wet paint in case you're wondering what that thing was. And putting in a little dash of light there for the lower lip. And relating that to the bottom of the lip. Kind of working across the forms, really. How one form influences another form. Putting in a little more of a dark shape there. And we're softening this little corner. Now for the last... Uh, I think 12 minutes or so of this painting, or at least for the underpainting. I'm going to talk a little bit about edge because I noticed that I'm going to be focusing a lot on the uh, edge in this little last uh, sequence of time. So I'm putting in, first of all, a plain division, a clean plain division for the bottom of the uh, the side of the mouth as we approach the uh, the mandible of the mouth but at the same time we're actually going to be looking at the edges between the shapes so now we're going to sharpen this little edge here so there are two types of edges that we can think of uh, for now so we're thinking of the form edges uh, so you can think of inner edges outer edges so form edges would be the inner edges so the edges of the actual shapes within the face uh, or within the light so to speak and then the outer edges would be the edges on the side of the contour and the uh, side of each individual feature so for instance this is a uh, a f inner edge, a form edge that we're softening for the form of the uh, the eye socket to the left of your screen. We're softening that edge in relation to the uh, the edge on the uh, uh, directly beneath it. We have a much sharper edge uh, delineating the top plane of the upper eyelid with respect to the eye. And we also subsequently just sharpen the edge on the side of the eyebrow. And at the same time, kind of emphasizing that uh, top plane. So that plane of light that we were indicating earlier for the top, of, uh, top area of the eye socket. So contrasting soft and sharp edges are going to help to create uh, focus and focal points. So we're going to be sharpening edges that we want to bring focus to and we're also going to be sharpening edges that just have sharper edges in general. So suppose a sharp edge would be say the corner of a knife. That's a fairly sharp edge in comparison to say the corner of a feather. The corner of a feather is just going to be softer just by the nature of it. The corner of a knife is going to be sharper just by the nature of it. So the corner of a sharp plane, so that is the plane change uh, right here directly beneath the brush. So the plane differentiating this area right here of the front of the uh, 
the forehead is going to be a much sharper edge than say the uh, the corner of the cheekbone the little zygomatic region that's going to be a much softer edge just because in nature i'm pretty sure that that edge was much softer and so now we're just going to also at the same time kind of push the the form a little bit so that is we're pushing that light shape a little bit brighter for the um, the zygomatic region of the face this area right here the cheekbone just to get kind of the effect of form so now the areas of focus that we have sharpened are definitely the eyes so even right here around the corner or even still uh, sharpening that shape for the top of the eyelid and another shape that you'll notice that's much sharper is the nose that shape is much sharper than the mouth we're keeping the mouth a little bit softer a little bit more quiet especially around the corners of the mouth so the edges around the corner of the mouth are going to usually be a little bit softer than say the top middle of the mouth and now we're just going to put in another little plane with a sharper edge but not quite as sharp and just kind of balancing the lights now in relation to one another So now we're just going to soften this little shape here on the bottom of the chin. So the chin is going to be a shape uh, that's going to need, that's going to have some more attention paid to it in tomorrow's video. So the shape for the chin isn't quite there just yet, but in any case, we're softening this little, this little plane right on the corner of the side of the face. This little corner would be an outer corner because it's an area uh, it's an edge where light kind of terminates into shadow subsequently that edge would get softer anyway because the form is turning away from the light and now we're going to sharpen this edge here for the uh, uh, the collar that is another edge that is just, uh, by the nature of it, just sharper in general. So the edge for the collar of the face, the collar of the face, the edge for the collar contrasting the face is going to create a very sharp edge. Very much sharper in relation to the other edges. And you can see how the balance between the light or sorry, between the sharp edges and the soft edges is really helping out with the uh, the form. And I'll tell you what, what really helps with edge work is to work from life as much as possible. Rembrandt, of course, had an incredible understanding of edge. And back in those days, I mean, photography wasn't a thing. So, of course, he wasn't working from photo reference. So... Again, doing a lot of old master studies also really helps you notice things that maybe you never noticed before. And um, that's certainly something that I noticed, at least in this stage, is the attention being paid to edge and edge quality. And now we're going to be relating the edge quality for the, uh, uh, the top plane of the forehead in relation to the eye sockets. So we're going to be adding a little bit more plane changes here. But we're also sharpening and adding more focus to the forehead and the, the eyes in particular. And we're going to sharpen this little edge here too on the side of the forehead. So that area I'm noticing on the, the Rembrandt is going to be fairly sharp but soft in comparison to the side of the forehead. And again, another thing I should note is that the camera is on an angle. Uh, the last clip 
that you'll see in this video will be the uh, painting right in front, front and center with the camera right in the middle. So again, it's not really about, I know it's a master copy, but it's not about copying. I usually don't think about it as copying. It's about interpreting visual information. But in any case, the uh, edge right around here, we're actually softening. I think that this was a the cast shadow, so a shadow, a very slight shadow being casted from Rembrandt's hat. So that's why that edge that we were painting earlier was being softened, and now we're softening this inner edge on the side of the uh, on the model's face. So we're just going to sharpen that little shape back here. Adding a little bit more of a shape there for the uh, for the eye. We're just throwing in a little more of a a contrast between the eyebrow, and we're gonna soften this little corner right here on the side of the uh, the glabella. So now with only three minutes left in the video. Um, I'm thinking that I'm going to do more master studies. I think I'd rather call it a master study as opposed to a, um, a master copy. But in any case, I'm thinking of doing more videos like this uh, where throughout the week, um, maybe when I'm done recording my, my usual videos where I'm actually painting and talking, recording some footage of myself painting without necessarily talking and I'm thinking of trying to focus a little bit on uh, trying to create master studies so let me know what you think those of you that have made it this far into the video let me know what you think about these master studies uh, whether you want me to create more of these or not I personally think I'm going to create more of these uh, studies because it, I think it teaches me a lot. And another thing I should also talk about since the video is almost up is that uh, I also started this Rembrandt master study kind of just as a practice for the uh, larger painting that's going on in the studio. So those of you that are following the uh, daily videos know that I'm working on a much larger painting. So I was thinking Rembrandt would be the artist I would ask for guidance with that larger painting, that larger portrait that I'm working on. So anyway, just let me know your thoughts on whether you want me to create more videos like this throughout the week, just to balance the, uh, the longer, larger studio paintings that I'm making. I've had a lot of requests for uh, Diego Velasquez, uh, Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring and things like that. So I'll definitely take those into account. And if you have any other old master paintings you want me to to take a look at, I can certainly do that. But again, this Rembrandt is going to take a couple of sittings, a couple more videos uh, to further develop. So you will have the footage available to you tomorrow for the first color pass of the uh, Rembrandt master study. And that being said, I hope that today's video helps you out. I wish you the best in all of your artwork. And as always, I'm really trying to bring the experience of being here in the studio to you every single day. I wish you the best and I'll be back again tomorrow.